Hey everybody, it's Sophie and Marco to Shout Out Movies, the only movie review show on YouTube to review movies in terms of food. It's just Marco here once again, and <clears throat> I am here today to do another movie review. And this will be yet another one in the year long uh, study of Sharon's films and shows. And I decided to do this because I wasn't really in the mood to watch a new movie. And I wasn't really in the mood to watch a new-ish movie. So, so I, was, I was like, okay, you know, I'll choose to watch the older one. And that was the one that I chose. It's the one for this month. It's the, the Sharon movie of the month. And it's called The Americanization of Emily. But what I would like to call it is the normalization of false flags. And the funny thing is about this movie is that, <laughs> like, nobody talks about it. Nobody even knows that it exists. But this is yet another movie that if you watch it, you're going to be like, wow. <laughs> you, you know, you're going to be like, oh, <laughs> they made this movie in Hollywood? They made this movie, like, right out in the open, and they they released it for people to see? <laughs> You're going to be really shocked and surprised. I mean, it's, it's very surprising, because it feels like something that could never have been made nowadays in terms of the amount of stuff that they say. But that's the thing, is that as someone has pointed out in the comments in the past, this was around the era where Hollywood was telling you right out in the open what they were doing. And they made movies like Rosemary's Baby, Eye of the Devil. And what these movies did was that they were trying to normalize this type of behavior, and they're trying to basically explain to you in simple terms, what they're doing without actually saying, hey, everybody, we're doing this. You know, it, it's very sinister and it's very odd because it's it's almost like another movie that I would compare it to, <coughs> which this happens all the time, even with stuff that I've written a lot of the times. Uh, there's this movie called Nocturnal Animals. And it's all about this guy who has a really bad breakup. <laughs> and he he writes a, a movie. And it's all about her and him and they're together. And then she gets killed and brutally killed. <laughs> and then he has to solve her crime. It's, it's just really, really uh, interesting. An, an interesting idea. And that's sort of like what this is. And then what happens in the movie, too, is that he mails her the script. And and he's like, here, I'd like you to read this. And, she, and she's like, oh, what is this? That's what that's like what this is. And sorry about my voice. I don't understand. <clears throat> <coughs> sorry about that. So that's what this movie is. It's it's indirectly kind of confessing this is our game plan. This is what we do all the time. And it's it's a very interesting movie. I actually I think it is a masterpiece movie. I mean, for better or for worse of what it's telling you. It is it's very good in terms of writing, in terms of character, story, direction everything about this movie is pretty perfect i mean i watched it twice once last night and then once this morning because it was so full of layers and and the second time that i watched it i got a lot of stuff that i didn't get the first time so i did write a lot of notes i'm just going to tell you guys the basic plot and then I'm going to go look and reference all these notes because there are a lot of details that are worth talking about with this one in comparison to something like Mr. Ed, which was very simple, self-explanatory, 
Um, the movie is all about what you call a dog robber of um, World War II. And what it is, is it's this guy who has to make sure that all these military men have whatever food they want to eat. They're well-dressed. They they get to have fun, play games with each other, and they get to have parties all the time, and they get to have hookers, basically. And they're not really, quote-unquote, hookers, but they're these women who... They they come to these parties and they have sex with all these military men. And in exchange, they get a dress and they get, like, fucking candy bars and shit. It's really, it's really queer, honestly. And so he, this guy, he, he, he makes sure that they have all the things that they want. And that's all that he does. And he he even says, like... You know, my religion is that I'm a coward. And so, it's another film in terms of, like, Barabbas, where that movie also dealt with how, oh, Barabbas is a coward because he won't he won't let himself die for his religion. You, you know, like, this is the same type of thing where you have this main character, and he's a coward because he won't do what these evil people want him to do. And I'm saying that because he's choosing to do this very safe job instead of, you know, battling on the battlefield. You know, I don't know how any of that crap works, but, you know, he is a coward. He says that, he states that explicitly in the movie. He has a driver played by Julie Andrews, and, she, you know, she's she's good in this movie, and I'll say this, like, she has great hair in this movie. It looks so much better than in Sound of Music, where it looked like, like, I don't know, one of the worst things I've ever seen. And she did a really good job in this movie. So, yeah, it's kind of a redemption for her. And I think that this movie, it, it's less about Sharon and it's more about her. Because one of the things about this movie I'm researching is that it's very heavily marketed as the movie that's in between Mary Poppins and Sound of Music. And so this this is important in terms of her, I think, more so. Uh, but, you know, obviously this year isn't about her, so I'm just going to kind of leave that alone. I mean, I think that you guys could probably figure it out based on the story and everything. Uh, so, this driver, she is asked if she'd like to come to one of these parties, and she'd like to entertain these men, and, you know, oh, if she won't have to sleep with them, quote-unquote. And so then she comes to a party, and she ends up entertaining the dog robber himself instead. And then she ends up sleeping with him <laughs> instead. And so, and it's really funny and creepy and weird because, in a way, she's doing what she was supposed to do originally, but she's just doing it with him. So, it, it, it's almost like, it's as I said, it's like they do things and then they tell you, like, eh, we don't really do those things. You know, it's kind of like in Leave it to Beaver when the kids say, like, oh, I'm not doing that, I'm doing that. You know, like they're trying to find this cutesy wiggle room where they can say, I'm not actually doing that. You didn't word it this way. And it's the same type of thing where she she gets into like a little relationship with this dog robber, uh, Charlie. And they get together. And fr from then on, what happens is even worse because... Uh, one of his superiors, you know, I don't know any of these weird fucking, <laughs> these, these names, like, uh, a general sergeant admiral, whatever the fuck, like, uh, uh military person, <laughs> you know, that's all I, re I don't really care about these stupid titles that are meaningless to me, you know, uh, that they have no relevance to me, so, the, the military boss of the, the the Charlie's boss, 
So both of their boss, the the big the bigger boss of them, uh, <laughs> the older guy, he wants the first dead person on Normandy Beach to be a sailor because they, wait because these guys are actually in the navy, and <laughs> you guys see what I mean by how I don't really care about any of this specific crap about like the specific like. Yeah, he's in that, he's in that. Like, I don't really even care, to be honest, but they want the first person on Normandy Beach to be a sailor just so that the committee on something will give them more budget. So they they want to use D-Day as an opportunity to get funding and to promote an agenda, which, you know, is very, very typical of these types of people to take like a tragic event that's going to happen where you know they know that people are going to die and they want to take this event and they want to use it to get something else and what ends up happening after that is that he comes up with an idea for them to make a movie <laughs> and they they can make a movie of the supposed people taking apart the mines in the minefield on the beach and he wants them to be the first people on Normandy Beach making this movie of the other people taking apart the mines and then whoever dies first they want to capture footage of that person like a snuff film and then they want to give that person a tomb and a statue and it's like if this isn't the creepiest shit ever I don't know what is. I mean, this is just so odd and so, like, heavily morally questionable. The fact that you'd be like, you you would be anticipating, like, okay, let's wait for the first person to die. And let's, you know, it's like this isn't a video game where, you know, you have a trophy that says, you know, first blood. You know, like they have that with Black Ops 3 where... Uh, the first person who gets a kill, they get a trophy, or they get they get a little uh, reward, like plus 500 experience points, first blood, you got the first kill in the match. Like, this isn't a video game, this is real life. And so they want the main dog robber, Charlie, to make this movie. And the whole movie from then on is basically him trying to get out of making this movie, because he does not want to go go there. You know, he doesn't want to... <laughs> like, who would? Like, honestly, like, even if you knew the outcome of this historical event, who would want to go on Normandy Beach on D-Day and get shot and killed? <laughs> like, did, did you see... If, if you seen, like, what it was like there? Like, I just... Uh, I'd rather jump off a cliff <laughs> with the fucking, I don't know, like, it just, that doesn't sound fun to me, uh, no matter what. So he knows, essentially, that that if he goes there, he'd probably die, and then what happens is this girl, Emily, and by the way, Julie Andrews is Emily in the movie, she kind of breaks up with him, and and because she's scared that he's going to die and then he goes there and stuff happens and 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 I'll have to explain more as this goes along because you're not going to believe what happens i mean if you're already shocked and flabbergasted over this this plot of a movie 1964 just wait one of the, the things about this movie is that another way that it, it sort of double talks to you where it says it's something and then it does something else is in regards to whether or not this is a propaganda film. To me, this is very heavily a propaganda film for American for American war, the American war machine, it's a, it's very much like war is good and America is good. 
And it, it's in a way where it's it's really off-putting because it's like they're just shoving this stuff down your throat. It it um at first this movie almost felt like the Top Gun of the '60s because there's so many points in this movie where they're promoting Hershey's chocolate bars, and I gotta say, like Hershey's chocolate bars are trash. And I just learned too that like apparently, back then in World War Two, that you'd have all these European chocolate factories and they would mysteriously explode. And then they would say, oh no, another factory mysteriously burnt down. And then, of course, the, the Americans would come and force them to, to buy their Hershey bars because they knew that these Hershey bars were such trash that Europeans wouldn't want them unless they were the only things available. Because when I was trying to do my little Hershey bar experiment, which, if you don't know, very interesting that I decided to do that and then do this video. Uh, you know, go search for the worst moments of the year. I think probably the first part video, uh, there is so little chocolate in a Hershey's bar. In a, in a, in a bar, there is only like 11% cacao. So that's why I was trying to eat like six or seven Hershey's bars is because there's so such little chocolate that's actually in these bars. 90% of a Hershey's bar is milk and sugar and shit and butter. So, you know, Hershey's bars, they're really not any good. But this movie, Americanization of Emily, it's either like a smart satire and like showing like oh <laughs> Hershey bar <laughs> or it, it's like a weird promotion like they're they're promoting Hershey's bar so much in this movie that y you could literally probably name this movie Battle of the Hershey bars and it would fit in with the the film like there are so so many times in the movie where their people are being bribed with Hershey bars and it's really creepy too because it's like they talk about you know don't take candy from strangers and like practically half this movie is is Charlie the main character and he's giving all these candy bars to Julie Andrews and so there's lots of little uh underneath the surface stuff with that uh but again this is not about her, this is about someone else. And so I, I can't, I don't want to get more into that because I wasn't focusing on that when I watched this film. And I would say this was much better than Eye of the Devil too. So, you know, if you're keeping track of like the movies, I probably, I don't know, like Barabbas was more epic than this movie. But this movie was a... I don't know. I'd have to think about if this was better or worse than Barabbas. Because Barabbas had that fight with with that guy. And it was really one of the best fights in movie history. Uh, one of the few problems of this movie on the surface level is that it is written by the same writer as Marty. And so if you guys remember, the thing that I said about Marty was that it was good, but it cut off very early and abruptly. And it's the same thing in this movie where it cuts off and it's a very abrupt ending. And it feels like there was still like, I don't know, like 10 to 15 minutes left in the story. Uh, but for some reason, they just cut it off with this odd ending. But, of course, the ending kind of serves their purpose, so, um, whatever. That was one of the few issues, though, an abrupt ending. Now, we have to talk about one of the elements about the movie is that the Admiral, I guess he was an Admiral, whatever the fuck he is, the old guy, uh, <laughs> the old guy who came up with the idea to make this movie, he is actually in a hypnotic trance 
for uh, almost the entire film. <laughs> he then and he then gives them the order to make the hoax movie, and he also says the first person who dies on Normandy Beach has to be a sailor. And what happens is really creepy because he's in his office and this guy's talking to him and he doesn't realize that this guy is frozen solid. Like he's just sitting there with no emotion, with no human anything. He's just sitting there frozen and silent. Like he's just so like hypnotized and and in and, and like an alternate state. And then what happens is even creepier because he falls on the floor and he's frozen in place like a like a, a, a rock and and then he's taken to the hospital. And you know, this was very uh you know, I don't like to use like fear mongering buzzwords. I don't like to do any fear mongering, but he was very much like a like an MK Ultra study patient, like that it was very odd. And then they say uh, he's been getting these eccentric flashes ever since his wife died, and so that was that was that was odd too. Eccentric flashes, you know, the way that he was. It wasn't like they were trying to frame it like he like he broke and like he was just in such stress from the war. But the way that it's presented on the screen is that he is in a, a trance state and that he doesn't know what he's thinking and he's almost like being told what to say. And then at the end of the movie, what confirms this is that he's talking to the other guy who's uh, Charlie's boss. And he's saying, like, I don't even remember what movie. What are you talking about? And he can't even remember uh, being in this state. And then he says, wait, was this like an idea that I came up with when I was when I was out of my mind or something? Like, it was it was really like telling that he could not remember at all any of this. Because it was like it was his alternate uh, personality, his alternate uh person so I mean there you go right there I mean very interesting stuff definitely something they wouldn't show today because it would be too real and then there was an amazing scene where the main character he's about to leave to go to his death or to go to another base and then go to his death. And he's he has this long conversation with Julie Andrews before he gets on the plane. And she's trying to break up with him. And she's, she's acting terribly, very immature, you know, like a lot of the people I've talked to you guys about. And, and he, he destroys her. I mean, he, he tears apart her entire character and just deconstructs her entire like view of being a coward you know because she's she's breaking up with him because she's claiming he, you know he's a coward so that's a bad thing and he he deconstructs all of the things that she says and then he's like you're a bitch <laughs> he he gets on the plane it's just the greatest thing ever like the scene it goes on for like 10 minutes and it's just him wrecking her character and it's like it's another thing where you'd never see that nowadays you know nowadays they'd have the female character berate the male character and then the male is just like <laughs> after Charlie dies his boss says and and basically his boss he turned out to be in on this hoax in a different way where he actually wanted Charlie to be the first one to die and that that was the true plan. And so Charlie drops his camera. He wants to abandon the mission and his boss points a gun at him and shoots him in the leg. 
and forces him to run into the fire line on Normandy Beach without any protection, without any weapon, and it's basically just so he can die. And then after this, the boss says to the mother of Julie Andrews that he didn't just die, he sacrificed his life. And the word is sacrificed is purposefully emphasized like that. Like, you know, if you were to say he sacrificed his life, you know, that's how you'd say that. You wouldn't say he sacrificed his life. But that that word, it was like in the script, they purposefully made that word be emphasized. Like, I would almost suggest that if you got the script that this guy was given, it would probably have some sort of a writing around that word. Because it's very strange the way that he says it. I mean, just think, you can say it all at once, he sacrificed his life. Okay, that's like reading a book. Or, you can say, he sacrificed his life. That's emphasizing the word sacrificed. Or, you can say, he sacrificed his life. That would be emphasizing the three words, sacrificed his life. But to just emphasize the word sacrificed, it <laughs> it really told you what the movie was about. I mean, as we've discovered with basically every movie that this woman has, was involved in, uh, it, there is a theme of sacrifice, and there is a theme of somebody dying for other people. Uh, and so there you go. That's when we find out that this movie isn't an anti-war movie in the slightest. It's a pro-sacrifice movie, just like Barabbas. Then at the end of the film, something even creepier happens where the main character... Let's find it. The main character actually shows up at this other base in South Africa or something, and he literally gets up out of a body bag and takes his own body tag off, along with all these other fake victims that were supposedly, quote-unquote, killed on Normandy Beach, and it's revealed he's alive and well. And then he's transported back to the base, and he meets up with his boss and his love interest. And he announces that he's going to tell the truth and expose these corrupt people and their hoax and this whole conspiracy. But this is when the movie... This is, this is when Emily the love interest, quote-unquote, has to perform the ultimate seduction. She, the whole movie, we're wondering, like, how is she going to, is she going to factor into the plot at all, or is she just going to be like this romance? Well, no, she, she has to do sort of like a spy thing, where she persuades him to, to completely abandon telling the truth. You know, we're shown this culture at the beginning of the film where all these women are entertaining. Wait, I'm looking at my notes. And, oh, yeah, I already did that. Okay, so after she is already done what all the women at the beginning of the film were doing, she unknowingly convinces him to do the wrong thing. She practically bullies him into lying. Because she actually says, once again, sacrifice is the most important thing that you could do as a person. And then she says, what will she do if he's in prison? You know, as if she's so helpless she can't close her legs because he's in prison. That's, that's what she's telling him. Like, that's the kind of creepy-ass weird shit she's telling him. And then she tells him that telling the truth is a selfish thing to do. And that war isn't bad. It's the virtues of war that are bad. And it's like... <laughs> God, this bitch. And it's, it's so shitty because, you know, the boss who shot his friend in the leg, 
he's standing there cackling and just like going like, ooh, yeah, she's she's doing it. I don't have to persuade him. I don't have to do anything. Oh, I'm safe because of this stupid bitch who's, uh, who's doing something that's really bad. Oh. And then the D-Day invasion is originally called off. And and what happens is he goes there and then he finds out that, ooh, maybe a way that he can get out of doing this movie is that they can go there. And then it's like, oh, well, they got there so late that the people are already on the way to perform the mission. Uh, but then it's really sad because he wakes up and he finds out that the first invasion was called off. And when he asks why... They say, because the moon didn't come out. And if that isn't an occult red flag right there for, right there in the open for you, I don't know what could be. They need to, the moon to come out so that they can commit this mass sacrifice and so that the ritual is performed properly. And so yet again, like that in and of itself was interesting. And yeah, once again, a film with her is about sacrificing. The even weirder point is that she's really nowhere to be seen in this movie to me. I mean, I watched it twice. I my I had my eyes glued to the screen because I was trying to see where is she, where is she. Uh, she must be in the background for like a split second. It, it disguises itself as an anti-war film, but in reality, this really is a pro-Hollywood film because it tells you right out in the open, this is what Hollywood does. I mean, when you talk about the thing with Stanley Kubrick and the moon landing, you know, even if, you know, I don't think that he did that. I don't think that that is an accurate conspiracy story. But... They're telling you that this is the kind of stuff that they do. I mean, they are telling you. They are saying, like, look, this is the kind of stuff we do. We we go and we film these special little movies so that people can get what they want in high places. And uh, it's very... It's very telling. And one of the plot holes of the movie, too, you know... The, the, another thing about this movie is that there are a lot of plot holes and there are a lot of things that needed to be explained that weren't explained because the plot of the movie on the surface really wasn't very important to them and one of the plot holes that are that's very uh troubling to me is that we're led to believe that a film camera from the 1940s can survive being drenched and soaked in water. I mean, he's sitting on the boat, he has the camera, uh, just rain is covering the camera, he doesn't have any protection on the camera at all, there's nothing on the lens or anything, and then he drops the camera in the ocean, and then he picks it up, and it's like, do you really think that a camera could survive a uh, from this time period, like, being used after it was that damaged by water, or that you could even get one picture out of that, like, no, I don't think so, like, that's something I could be wrong about, but I'm just using logic, you, you know, there's already enough trouble when you get water in an iPhone, like, just a little tiny splash of water, but we're led to believe that somehow this film camera from the 1940s can can be dunked in the water in the ocean and it can, can be picked up and used perfectly uh yeah uh, fuck off with that crap and i'll say that the book might have been anti-war because this was based on a book <sighs> And as I said, she says that war isn't bad. It's the virtues of war that are bad. And it's like, no, war is bad. That's that's not a debatable issue. <laughs> like, 
Like, that's one of the few issues that, like, really isn't debatable. You know, you can debate all sorts of political issues, but one of the main ones that you can't debate is that war is bad or not. I mean, that's very self-explanatory. That's bad. The most amazing reveal of the film is when the character unzips from the body bag. Because it's the exact type of thing that people talk about with a lot of these uh with what they call crisis actors false flags like you ever heard of operation northwood uh this is hollywood openly admitting that this is what they do as i said and to me something else is that if this actually happened like let's say that this man actually lied about this massive hoax conspiracy about D-Day. Let's say that that actually happened. Let's pretend like that is what happened. Well, we know in 2023, anyone pointing out the truth nowadays would be called a crazy conspiracy theorist. And that's a topic that's worth talking about, is that, you know, this... If anything, this movie should encourage you to be a quote-unquote conspiracy theorist because they're just, they're openly admitting that this is what they do. (laughs) I mean, it's, it's pretty bad. And then, of course, the producer who Sharon met and she got work through him, he fired William Wyler from the movie as director and of course, if you guys don't know, he's the guy who dile- who directed The Little Foxes, which I reviewed last year. Uh, he's a classic film director. Well, this producer, he fired William because he wanted to change the script. The script, the propaganda was so important that the great William Wyler was turned away. That should show you guys how important this movie was as a piece of propaganda and how important every single word and plot point was. The fact that this great director, I mean, who knows what he wanted to change, too. Like, because to me, I would change the movie. Like, I would change the ending a little bit. I would alter it around. I mean, (laughs) after everything that happened to this main character... He's not going to tell the truth about what happened. (laughs) Like, wow, that's really, that's a great thing. Not, like, uh, telling the truth is is another undebatable good thing. The party scene, there is a party scene that they show where you see all these military men being entertained by these glorified hookers. I'm just going to call them hookers because that's basically what they are. It was filmed, and this was a part of the trivia. It was filmed the same day JFK was assassinated. This marks a particular significance since you could say it's like they're celebrating his death on screen behind the scenes. And you could also speculate that this might have been the scene where Sharon was in in the background because the scene includes a lot of these women who are just in the background at this party and so she might have been one of them Uh, so that's another thing that's interesting and then at one point the clock at the party says 7.50pm and of course 7 plus 5 is 12 and apparently JFK was assassinated around noon a little afternoon. So, <laughs> I mean, e- even if it's not like 12 on the clock, it's 7.50, 7 plus 5, 12. That, that's another kind of weird little thing that, you know, might have been intentional, might not have been. Because they say in the movie that, like, she's supposed to be home by 10.30 or something. So, it's a long way away from 10.30 Uh, at this party. It doesn't really make sense overall when you take into consideration 
like the the pacing and like what happens next is like immediately she goes to bed with the 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 what do they call it? the dog robber fucker uh that happens like almost immediately after that and so you really can't tell like i i don't think it was actually supposed to be 750 And now we have also solved the importance of Mr. Ed's duo television episodes. One episode involving men sailing to America and Sharon making out with a sailor. And then one involving a military character. And the fact that the retelling of Chris Columbus's voyage was used with the characters from the show a direct parallel with this movie where the entire story on Normandy Beach is a retelling of history, completely false. She shot this movie first, but it had to air after the Mr. Ed episodes. As I said, the placement of this movie in between Julie's movies and then after Mr. Ed's episodes, it, that's another thing. And it was really funny, too, because this is just a little side note. I was g- going to sleep, and for some reason, I don't know if I woke up and I wrote this in my sleep on my notes, or I think I wrote it when I was half asleep and then put my phone down finally, but when I was in bed, I held, I put I put on my phone, she is the oinker per warmer. L M, <laughs> like what the fuck is that? So that's another important note to study. She is the oinker performer, you know, like performer. L M. <laughs> Maybe it's a secret code. <laughs> the importance of the final sequence in Normandy Beach is that it's not realistic to what happened at all. I mean, it feels like a museum exhibit of the past where they're just doing whatever they want with barely little to worry about. In reality, we know that even stepping foot onto Normandy Beach at this time was like committing suicide. So it's emphasizing more so the whole sequence is a retelling of history, not the actual historical event. In fact, it makes the whole D-Day event itself look like hooks. Like, it, it, the way that it's framed, it doesn't even feel real. It just feels like a contrived thing so that they can take these pictures, these videos. It's a, it's a very interesting... As I said, this is an interesting movie. I mean, after all the stuff I've talked about... Uh, it it seems like this would be a good film if you're interested in this subject to watch. Uh, so, overall, I really like this film, even taking into consideration I didn't like the ending where Julie Andrews tells the main character to lie, and then he says, oh, fine, whatever, and then the movie abruptly ends. You know, you could have almost made a whole second movie where it's all about him and he's being chased around by conspiracy theorists telling him, you know, we know the truth, we know the truth. You know, they could have done like a movie like that or something. There was a lot of smart satire in this, but (laughs) a lot of it really isn't satire. It's just openly telling you what they do. Which which makes it pretty bad that they would openly admit this, but it was all a part of the the spell. So I would rate this movie in terms of food. It's tough because it has to be something where there's more to it than one would think. And it's hard to think about a food that's like that because so many foods nowadays, you know, they're exactly what you think about. You know, they're they're very one-dimensional works of cuisine. I don't know what to say. They're 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 all like 
you know, you it, there's not not really food with layers that I can think of, or hmm, you know what? No, that that wouldn't work. No. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to rate this movie something that's going to make you guys, like, roll your eyes, okay? Hershey bars. <laughs> no, wait, no, 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 no. I know. Milky Ways. Now, hear me out, because everyone... No, wait, no. Candy corn. Candy corn, like Milky Way, is an extremely underrated candy. I really love candy corn. It's one of my favorite candies of all time. Uh, I've always loved it. I don't like it in a in a big a big dose. You know, I just like to have a handful or maybe a little bowl's worth, and I don't like to have a lot of it like over the course of October. But I do like to have candy corn at some point. And a lot of people just write it off as just this one-dimensional sugar-tasting thing, like waxy sugar. Like, they don't, for some reason, like, they can't experience the taste that I experience. Because when I get candy corn, the first thing is the smell. The smell of candy corn automatically associates Halloween to me. It automatically, I can think of, like, getting my trick-or-treat bucket and then smelling the the bucket and being like, ooh, I can't wait to go through all these candies at home when I'm done trick-or-treating. Like, that's what I think of when I smell candy corn. And then when when you get it out, of course, you know, you have those three layers, you know, the colors... And just like with the movie, they're kind of pretending to you that there are three different layers of flavor and and that they're doing something that they're not. Because then you just, you eat it and it's like it's all the same. But when I was a kid, I I was able to like kind of trick myself into thinking that they were different flavors. Like I thought the white was a certain flavor. The white part was like more so cream and then the orange and the yellow were pretty similar. And I would eat it like the tip and then the center and then the big part. And, and like eat it, eat the three different layers. And then for some I would just eat them all at once. Uh, that's what this movie is to me. It's like a bowl of candy corn. So, anyways, please like this video, comment, tell me what you thought of it, and what you think of this plot because it's insane like just like Barabbas it's another sacrifice movie and Eye of the Devil another story about sacrifice I mean uh, the next thing will be in February and it will be an episode from the man from uncle and I hope that that doesn't turn out to be about sacrifice too so And then please subscribe to this channel if you'd like to see more honest movie reviews. Goodbye everybody, see you soon.